I want to first start with a quote. I know, cliche opening, but I really like this quote from Steve Jobs. It's that you can't connect the dots looking forward, but you can only connect them looking backwards. So you will have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. So looking back, seeing how the dots had connected in my life, I found a pattern of moments that I have actually stepped away certain paths in order to succeed. The overarching message I want to convey today is not like these two common quotes presenting over here. They may hold some truth, but what I'm going to tell everyone today actually somehow contradicts to both quotes. And I'm going to convey my point through stories that brought me to the international stage of Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, or ICEF. So I first want to start with why I love biology and how I found out that I love biology. So I want to start with a story. When I was little, I always loved to question things beside me, and I came up with like crazy theories. So one of my hypotheses was this. Holding hands the first day, on, uh, holding hands the first time on the wedding day makes babies. You know when the bride, um, bride's father gives her hand to the bridegroom? Yeah, I thought that moment was when um, people had babies. But unfortunately, my hypothesis was soon proven to be wrong, because when I was four, I attended a wedding with a pregnant bride. So I asked my grandfather, why is a bride pregnant? And my grandfather was super awkward, and he told me that, oh, you don't have to know that right now. You'll know that in the future. But I was like, grandfather, are you patronizing me because I'm only four? I want to know why. And I asked my mom, I asked my dad. No one wants, wanted to answer me. But years later, I had my first life science class. And my teacher was Mr. Tiller. You'll know him if you're here during the first half of the TED Talk. So he came in and told me that our um, our topic that day was birds and bees. So he provided us with a question box, telling us that we are free to throw in any questions regarding reproduction. So I threw in the question from years ago, asking Mr. Tiller, how do people make babies? And Mr. Tiller did answer us that question, even though in retrospect, his answer was a major simplification. But that made me understand that biology answers my questions of my observations to the world. So see over here, this is Mr. Mr. Tillard Science page, and that's me with my friends doing observations while we're young, and that album name is called Observations. So what I want to say here is that I make observations to the world, and I propose questions and theories because of these observations, and I found out that biology can actually answer these for me, so that's why I at first fell in love with biology. So I found out that I love biology, but that wasn't enough for me, because I want more, I want recognition, I want everyone to know that I love biology and that I'm good at biology. So I, like grades and answering questions in schools are not, were not enough for me. So I turned to the path of International Biology Olympiad, or IBO. So IBO was like really hard, and I will give an example. So Paige, what will you think of when you see this word? Probably a book, right? A page of a book? But in the IBO world, page means polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Yes, this sounds crazy. I'm going to give another example. CRISPR. For people who know me, you might know that I am in love with this word CRISPR. But this might just sound like a nonsense word. But CRISPR in my world means cr cluster regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Yes, I am in love with like, these two words. And I might sound geeky because I am like a science geek. These are what I learned in IBO and what I learned in some book called, called Campbell's Biology. Any one of you who know um, AP Biology will know this sort of book. But I started reading this book when I was in eighth grade because I said I want to compete in IBO. So I started reading Campbell's Biology. But don't get me wrong, I actually enjoyed reading Campbell's Biology a lot because I see the, these weird words and hard graphs, and if I can tackle it down to something I know with my own knowledge, I'll be very happy because I feel like I will understand some things. Just like Mr. Tiller's Science Box. It answers my questions to the world, so at first I was super happy and excited to read these um, books. Because it can answer my questions such as, how does food become poop? Through graphs like these. Like, these graphs are hard, but if I can tackle them down to something I know, it actually answers my questions. I see in the world. So I participated in the actual IBO in my sophomore year. I passed the first round, advanced into the second round, and finally got placed number 57, which is the top 1.8% of the country. But that still didn't got me into the finals. I was super close, but that gave me a huge boost to continue participating in IBO. 
vowing that I will return next year. But at the same time, I entered a biomedical lab working with regenerative stem cells. In that lab, I at first entered because I wanted to improve my lab techniques because I really like the hands-on activities. And I wanted to have some lab internship experience before I entered college. And I still remember clearly the first day when I entered the lab, I was working with DNA plasmids. So when I went home, my mom asked me, how did you like the lab? And I still remember that I took out my Campbell's biology. I flipped to biotechnology and I pointed at the graph of DNA plasma transfection. I told my mom I actually did this and that and I did like I all did this all by my own hands. Like just imagine my joy and excitement. It was so like exciting to actually do something I've been reading for so long. So that's what my joy came from at first. I actually got to implement the graphs I see from Campbell's biology. But I did not know when I first entered the lab that it would take up so much time of my studying in IBO because, as I said before, I was still preparing IBO for my junior year. I enjoyed being in labs so much, but I still could not give up IBO because that was my dream after all. But I started to direct my IBO studies to winning that high accomplishment because I want to receive recognition through that. So at first, the studying sessions of tackling down problems became forced and sometimes a burden. As a result, I did not do well in my IBO junior year. Like, I kept this a secret from a lot. I only told some of my close friends about this. But while I was participating in my junior year for IBO, I didn't even pass the first round. Like, last year, I said I almost got into the final round. But for my junior year, I didn't even pass the first round. And I was super embarrassed. Like, I was so scared and embarrassed to tell others. And I found out that the emotions I felt because I was embarrassed and scared to let others know of my failure were actually stronger than my own sadness and like negative emotions for not being able to proceed. So it was then that I realized my dreams for IBO were distorted into desires of gaining other people's recognition. So given my failure in IBO, I only had one role left right now for me, which is the research studies. So I took my opportunity and changed my whole direction into the research labs. While I was in labs and doing my studies, I only did the labs that are small and individual, the ones that we see in textbooks. We know the results. There were expected results, like the DNA transfection. But I see a lot of the graduate students doing their whole projects, like discussing their projects with, with professors and their peers, and trying to change variables in order to find out the solution. Because what they're doing was taking a question and trying to um, design experiments to figure out the unknown solution. I really wanted to be like them. I was only doing basic experiments. However, the lab could not provide me with this chance of doing independent studies. But at the same time, I got a recommendation from another teacher so that I can enter another lab to do independent studies. So after um, sending in resumes, requests, and interviews for the head professor, I found out that the lab was actually physics dominated. I cherished this opportunity so much and I was so like excited that I finally got a chance to do an independent project, but it was in a physics lab. So at first I was quite scared and I was worried that if I would do well in that lab because I thought that my strength was in biology. So I didn't know if I would give out my best if I entered this physics dominated lab. But I later found out that this physics dominated labs were just using physics materials, but there are so many other applications like the biology that I'm good at. So eventually I entered this um, physics dominated lab. So I now step into a new environment of letting go somewhere I was used to. But at the same time, I also volunteered at a charity called Ronald McDonald's House, which I regularly met children in diseases with urgent medical care. And many of them are young kids who were undergoing chemotherapy. Seeing kids like only one year old or two year old having to battle with cancer and having to struggle through this chemotherapy um, road, I really wanted to do something about cancer research. So I was given, I was lucky because I can choose my own project um, title. So I said I want to direct my studies towards cancer research. And so I took this biomedical application of my yearnings to um, improve on cancer research and applied it to the materials in my physics lab, which are a sort of nanomaterial. And I created my project. So after weeks of trials and errors, the postdoc finally told me that I have to change my topic. But I mean, I came up with a research topic myself. 
I came up with a question. I came up with all the procedures. I came up with all the ways to change variables, and I collected all the instruments I need. And I'm starting to actually do the lab for actually months. This was my first topic, and not a lot might know that I actually did a topic before my um, luciferous FND, because that is my second topic. So this first topic, I worked a lot of time on it, but I eventually had to give up. But at first, I thought if I continue to work hard and change variables, someday I will success, right? Because hard work leads to success. But I found out that I was wrong. And this was another moment that I was faced with the challenge of stepping away from one original path to enter a new one. So I reluctantly stepped away from my first project. And changing my entire project was just one example of facing this challenge because within projects, there are more moments like experiments that I have to face with stepping away some sort of original path. So I have enc encountered numerous of these challenges while doing my project right now. And I want to show one little um, example of that. So now I'm going to talk about some a little bit of science geeky stuff, only two minutes. So yeah, this is what my project looks like. So what I did was I basically took pr proteins that give off light, luminescence, and I coat them onto um, nanomaterials right here in the green. So I created this hybrid. And what I did was I let cells, which is the blue ones, eat the hybrid. And after a time, I measure how many of um, the cells will eat up these hybrids, so I will know if the cells are alive or the cells are dead. And thus, I can know how toxic chemotherapy drugs were in our body. So this was basically an overview of my um, project. So what I did was I only wanted to measure how many of the particles were inside the cell. So I did the very straightforward and obvious path, which is just washing these um, particles away with a pipette. So I added a buffer solution, and I tried to rinse up the particles outside because a lot of cells will stick to the plate. So I thought that I can physically remove these particles, right? It's very straightforward and obvious. And I did it a lot of times, and my results were all failing. And I thought to myself, I just continue to try, and I always blame my own skills or like pipetting techniques. And I still remember one of my best friends asked me, Sharon, if you're continuing to do this over and over, you're failing, what should you do? And I just answer her that, I don't know, I just continue to do it, continue to try, and someday I might success. But then my postdoc told me that it was about time to do problem shooting. So problem shooting is very self-explanatory. It's basically taking a problem and um, discussing what is causing this problem and trying to change. So he presented me with this new idea, which is using trypsin. Trypsin, you can think of it as a poison chemical. It kills cells. And because before, I always thought that by only measuring the um, particles in the cells, I will have to physically remove the ones outside. I never thought of other ways, such as denaturing the particles outside, or like inactivating the particles outside by using maybe chemicals like trypsin. Because I was really afraid of using trypsin, because I thought cells will be dead if you use trypsin. But as you can see, there are just so many other processes that follow this single process, meaning that there's not really one road or one path that I can measure my particles. Because if I continue to hold on to that path of rinsing them out or like um, physically remove them and like trying to blame my own lab techniques, I will never get to this success. If I don't change a way of doing my lab and I continue to work hard or um, try hard persevere, I will never success in this little experiment. So through these experiments, I realized the importance of letting go. People always thought that for success, you have to stick to a path persevere, try hard, and you will succeed. But sometimes you just have to let go, because not any single path guarantees success. However, I also don't want to say that you don't have to think of success. Just enjoy the moment and have fun, and success will come your way, because that's not true either. Indeed, I did enjoy the lab work. I had fun designing my own experiments and discussing them with my professors, but I worked hard too because I modify my experiments in order to have this successful outcome. If I were just having fun in the labs, I won't have to do this a lot. So take a look at this. This is my absence sheet. And I would want all of you just to take a guess how many gongjia or how many absences I had in one single semester. <laughs> just to um, a reference, there's only 800 periods per semester. <laughs> So a, a thousand might not be like possible. So 
I got 239 gongjia in one semester. There's only 800 periods. So that means that over one fourth of the time, I was not in the school. I was in labs trying to um, work, work out a solution to my project. So if I was just having fun or if I ju was just enjoying, I can might as well just get into lab and get an internship experience. But I wanted to solve the problem that I first um, proposed. Even though I changed topics, I still did a topic about cancer research because um, my postdoc did tell me that cancer research might not be a common topic in my lab, which is the lab that I'm working with because they're working with materials. But I still told him that I, I actually want to do cancer research because that's a problem that I really want to solve. So having this notion in mind, I worked hard. So my experiment ultimately succeeded and I earned a third award in Intel ISIP. So arriving at their forum, I saw their motto, think beyond, almost everywhere, from registration centers to closing ceremonies. Think beyond. This is what ISEF wants the finalists to keep in mind. So participating in ISEF broadened my horizon a lot because I see a lot of finalists coming up with problems on their own and using so many different ways to solve them. I want to talk about a little story over there. So my category was materials science. This is basically a melting pot. There are projects ranging from physics to chemistry and to mine, which is biology. And the booth beside me was from a Georgia twin. And they were doing a physics experiment, which is trying to solve the shortage of biking helmets by presenting um, physics paper modeling of different um, structures. But I also saw a boy from another lane, which they are doing the exact same projects. I even saw like the paper modeling with structures on his booth too. So I told the Georgia twin that I think there's some other guy who did the same experiment with you. So we went over to his booth and looked at his poster together. And after looking at the poster, I have to say I don't really know about a lot of the structures, so I don't really know what he was doing. But the Georgia twins told me that what they were doing was actually different from the boy. Even though what they're trying to solve was maybe the identical question, but their um, ways to tackle this problem were so different. So this anecdote is just one microcosm of life. There are just so many ways to achieve one same goal. There's no like one special road that will guarantee you success. So while persevering for your dreams and goals in life, remember to also bear with the courage to letting go of unachievable paths. No matter what you're doing, also you have to keep a goal in mind, like a motivation, unless you're doing it for fun, like your hobbies, or else you really have to have the notion and you have to think of success as your ultimate goal. Looking back, like how Steve Jobs has said, you might see your dogs connect together and you might find out that you actually have more, uh, more courage to let go path than you have ever thought before. So just months ago, I stood in Taiwan's presidential hall and spoke to President Tsai Ing-wen about our worldwide achievements. And I also talked about how I, how I want to continue to work hard and solve the problems I observe in the world. Like the four-year-old me asking about the process of pregnancy. While holding this goal in mind, I aspire to be a doctor or a surgeon scientist right now because I want to directly solve the problems that I see in people. I love the warmth of human-human interaction and I want to be someone that gives back to the society and can actually change someone's life for the better. But who knows, years later, I might be a lawyer, or, I'm, or you might see me teaching here in Fuxing. Who knows? But I do know that I will not give up on my ultimate goal despite occasional failures. So once more, two words for all of you. Think beyond. Thank you.